Hello everyone and welcome. Today we'll be studying the energy module of the Year 11 chemistry syllabus and in particular we'll be talking about the properties of hydrocarbons. So in this part of the lesson we'll be talking about what makes hydrocarbons different to other chemicals and what kind of intermolecular forces contribute to these differences. Okay. So in water, you've studied intermolecular forces. So now you'll have a chance to apply that knowledge to a new set of chemicals. So first, we'll talk about trends in boiling points and melting points. So the trend for boiling point and melting point will be pretty much the same. It's just a change of phase. So mostly, we'll just be considering boiling points. So in general, melting and boiling points of hydrocarbons increase with their molecular mass. So as the chains get bigger, we tend to see increased boiling points. And that links back into our idea of fractional distillation. The bigger chains which settle at the bottom have much higher boiling points than the ones that sift up to the top. So at 25 degrees Celsius, methane, ethane, propane, and butane are all gases. So methane is natural gas, ethane is another similar to natural gas, sometimes gets mixed up with natural gas. Propane and butane are those uh, two chemicals that you find in gas canisters for your barbecue or for your um, hot plate. And so they're all gases at room temperature. So from C5 to C17, so C8 is octane and you know it's liquid because that's your petrol that you use. So generally this range here, C5 to C17 are all liquids. And Anything bigger than C18 is generally a solid. So we're talking about waxes, so paraffin wax, um, asphalt and bitumen, those kind of things. So they're all solid and you can see that. So we can explain these trends with intermolecular forces, right? So carbon and hydrogen are very similar in their electronegativity. So they don't, they don't attract their, elect their electrons in the bond very strongly um, compared to the other one. So they're pretty neutral in terms of their electronegativity. And they're also symmetrical. So if they're symmetrical, it means that there's no dipole moment. So that helps to um, explain some of the things that we see in hydrocarbons. So because they're, not, they're symmetrical and they're not electronegative in any way, they're considered nonpolar substances. So they have no dipoles, essentially. So the main intermolecular force is dispersion forces, which are very weak, as you know from your study of water. Now, dispersion forces increase with increased mass. So the more um, components of your hydrocarbon that you have, the more dispersion forces you have. And that's because there are more electrons and more protons, um, as well as an increased surface area. So chains tend to have greater intermolecular forces because of the increased surface area. So what that means is in comparison to a branch structure, a straight chain will be a better, will have more uh, intermolecular forces because there's more surface area for these dispersion forces to interact. Whereas a chain structure, even though it has the same molecular mass, because it's kind of pushing the other molecules away, we have less dispersion forces, which means it will be, it'll boil more easily. So the next uh, property that we'd like to talk about is density. So density is simply the mass per unit volume. So in the SI system we say it's the kilogram per meter cubed. So that's the standard unit of density. Okay. So the kilogram per meter cubed, so it's a mass over some kind of volume. Now the density of hydrocarbons increases with increasing mass. So for the same reason that the boiling point increases, it's because there are stronger intermolecular forces because there's more electrons and more protons available. Um, the same sort of system happens with alkenes and alkynes for the same reason. There's more electrons and more protons. And hydrocarbons generally have densities less than water. This is generally, but for alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, all of them will have um, densities less than water. But for other more complicated um, uh, hydrocarbons, we'll see some will have densities greater than water, but for now we'll just say most of them will have uh, densities less than water. Now the density being less than water also sort of links in with the next part which is solubility. So you've heard of a rule that says like dissolves like, right? 
So that means polar substances will dissolve polar substances, and non-polar substances will dissolve non-polar substances, but they won't dissolve each other. So hydrocarbons being non-polar will dissolve only in non-polar substances. Now dispersion forces found in both solvent and solute. So you can see here that solubility is related to having similar types of intermolecular bonding. So the reason why they won't mix with polar solvents, so here you have oil and water, so we're pretty familiar with how that works, um, because their dipole-dipole bonds, or hydrogen bonds, may be too strong to be pushed apart by the molecules, and then that means there's, not, there's no space that they can make to surround this new oil molecule or hydrocarbon molecule, so they won't dissolve. So ordinarily, when you have dis, uh, soli uh, dis dissolution, you have like water, say, coming and like surrounding what you're dissolving. But because there's only weak bonds um, from the hydrocarbon uh, connecting to the water, they can't really make space for these hydrocarbons, so they end up just forming little, um, little emulsions like this one. Okay? So generally, because of the dipole-dipole bonds being stronger than the dispersion forces, there's no space for dissolution to occur. So moving from that step to volatility and vapor pressure. So volatility, if something's very volatile, it means that you know, it's kind of unpredictable and about to explode. That's how we use it in the vernacular. But volatility just means it's the tendency of a particular substance to turn from liquid to gas. So something that's very volatile will easily turn to gas, and something that's not volatile will stay liquid. Okay? S volatile substances have low boiling points, which makes sense, because we compare at room temperature. So if it has a low boiling point, a boiling point below room temperature, it'll be very gaseous, whereas if it has a boiling point much higher than room temperature, it will be liquid, or maybe even solid. So volatile substances generally have weak intermolecular forces because when they're in liquid form, they're being weakly bound to each other, so they can easily just you know, fly off into space like that. So petrol in a container is what we call a dynamic equilibrium. So what that means is the rate of evaporation equals the rate of condensation. So here, the amount of little blue balls that fly off into space is equal to the amount that's going back to liquid. Now, we see that as just a liquid sitting there because we can't see the molecular scale of things. But what's really happening is that there's a molecule flying off from the liquid and then another one filling up that, the space that it made. So that's why it says dynamic equilibrium because things are happening that we can't see, but from a really far away point of view like us, we just see nothing changing. But really, it's changing very, very, very rapidly. Now vapor pressure, so we just spoke about volatility. Now vapor pressure is the pressure the evaporated liquid exerts on a container. Okay? Another way of thinking about it, so firstly we'll just talk about this one. So because each of these particles will hit the container wall, it exerts a little bit of a force. So for physics students, that collision and then change of momentum will exert a force on this container wall. Okay? Now the more particles you have, the more collisions with the wall, right? So the force will increase because you're hitting it more times. And so the pressure will increase. Okay? So the vapor pressure is how much pressure we exert on this wall because of the amount of gas in the, um, in the container base, uh, compared to the amount of liquid. Okay? Another way of thinking about it is the vapor pressure is the pressure at which a liquid will turn to gas at a given temperature. Okay? So for something with very low vapor pressure, at say 25 degrees, we need a very low pressure to allow that to turn to gas, right? So um, that's another way of thinking about what vapor pressure is. And the vapor pressure is a measure of volatility as well as a measure of intermolecular force strength. So they both relate the same thing. So the, the more volatile a substance, the higher the vapor pressure, which is what I just mentioned because the more volatile means you've got more gas, more gas means you've got more collisions, more collisions means you have bigger pressure. And even some solids have significant vapor pressure, so they can change to gas 
sort of like a sublimation process, but not exactly the same. So toilet deodorant and naphthalene in mothballs. Um, so you can smell them. They exert, a, they emit lots of gas, um, even though they're solid. And so you can, you can smell it and you can experience what that is. So as temperature increases, the vapor pressure increases because you have more energy in the molecules. So these molecules will, more of them will tend to go into the gas phase because they now have the energy to do that um, because the temperature is increased. Okay? So that wraps up today's lesson on the properties of hydrocarbons and how the intermolecular forces that, um, that are found within hydrocarbons tends to affect uh, these particular properties. And so we'll move on to the question section now and we'll hopefully see some of the things that we learned uh, in a more practical way. So question one, why would most hydrocarbons have lower density than molecules like water? Okay. So remembering density is sort of a measure of how tight together they are, so the, each molecule is. So we'll go through each one and see which one gives us the best answer. So hydrocarbons are bigger, thus they cannot be placed as tightly together. No, that's not right, because if you have a very large substance, even if it's very thin, just think of paper. You can stack a big bunch of paper together and you can have thousands of pieces of paper in a very small space. So that one's not right. So B, water is small, therefore the force of attraction between other molecules is big. Okay, the size of the molecule doesn't really tell you much about its molecular forces, so that one's not true either. So hydrocarbons have dipole-dipole forces, which are stronger than hydrogen bonds. Okay? So hydrocarbons generally don't have dipole-dipole forces. They're generally dispersion forces. And they're not at all stronger than hydrogen bonds. So that's, again, incorrect. Which leaves us with C, which is the correct answer. Water has hydrogen bonding, allowing for greater attraction between the molecules, and therefore reduce space between each molecule. So because you have bigger forces because of the hydrogen bonds, they can be packed closer together, or they'll tend to be closer together because they'll attract each other more closely. And so you get bigger density because there's more mass per unit volume. Okay. So explain why oil and water don't dissolve in one another. Okay. So this is talking about that like dissolves like sort of situation. So oil has dispersion forces while water has hydrogen bonds. That we know. Since the water is polar, it cannot dissolve the non-polar oil, and thus they cannot dissolve in one another. So remembering that because the water is polar, these oil molecules can't make enough room for themselves to be surrounded by these water molecules. So we get um, no sort of dissolution. We just get an emulsion. Okay. So moving on to question three. Explain why hydrocarbons such as ethane have a higher vapor pressure than water. Okay, so remembering that we are talking about explain here, which means simply to explain the cause and the effect of it. So the cause of ethane having a, of a higher vapor pressure than water is simply that ethane molecules are weakly attracted to one another. They have very small dispersion forces because it's quite a small molecule with no dipoles or hydrogen bonds. So this allows them to move more freely and thus exert greater pressure on the container. So if for a given temperature, there'll be more gas molecules of ethane than there will be of water, so they'll collide with the walls more frequently, so you'll get greater pressure. But the strongly bonded water molecules have limited mobility, so they can't move as far because they're really tightly held together, and therefore cannot exert a great amount of pressure on the container wall. Right? So because they're being held together, they can't escape to gas phase, so they can't really um, they can't exert any pressure on the wall. Okay. So if that's okay, we'll move to question four. Explain why the temperature of a system increase the vapor. So sorry. Explain why increasing the temperature of a system increases the vapor pressure. So again, the same verb here. Explain. Very common verb in HSC. So increasing the, vape, uh, the temperature increases the energy of the molecules, remember? Because temperature is sort of a measure of the energy of each molecule. The additional energy allows them to move more and thus exert greater pressure on the container. So remembering that when you exert, 
When you increase the energy, more particles can move into the gas phase and then hit the container wall, so you get a bigger pressure. Simply because there's more molecules, more molecules equals more collisions, and more collisions equals big pressure. Okay? So we'll move on to the last question, which is question five. Explain why high volatility is useful in some applications, but hazardous in others. So remembering, again, explain. Now, high volatility means that you get a lot of gas at a given temperature compared to another substance that has low volatility. So volatility is great for combustion since only gases can react with each other. Um, when I was in high school, when my teacher told me this, I kind of freaked out a little bit because what about wood? Wood burns, but it's a solid. Um, the difference is that wood, what's burning in wood is, the, is a set of gases and, um, and oils that have become a gas after you've heated the wood. That's why wood just doesn't catch flame straight away because um, you've got to break down some of those chemicals. So for combustion, only gases can react. Okay? Um, so that's the first thing. So a chemical that can form a gas easily will likely combust more completely. So because it can form a gas very easily, there's no energy wasted in evaporating it. So we get better combustion because it's faster and, um, and more complete. The high volatility, however, means that the chemicals are more prone to combustion um, in unexpected situations, creating potential fire hazards. Okay, so when you have high volatility substances, we have um, fire hazard simply because any spark might, you know, cause a big, uh, big fireball that could hurt people. Okay, so that wraps up today's lesson on the properties of hydrocarbons. So we've looked at the properties of hydrocarbons and how the intermolecular forces sort of interplay with those um, properties to give you a unique set of chemicals which we call hydrocarbons. So next lesson we'll talk about storing hydrocarbons safely and so I look forward to seeing you next time.